All right, so. Um, I'm going to talk all loud, just regardless whether it's a full room or not. Um, we got the part basics coming through here. Um, so basically what we're looking at is a uh, couple different things in when you're creating parts or whatever. So we're, we're, we're going back to basics here. Um, one of the things that we run into a lot is uh, the whole like how to start a sketch. And sometimes what I find is people get pinned into a certain way like oh, I have to click this, click this, click this, click this and that gets me the start into the sketch. Um, really what it comes down to is I got the Dr. Seuss there because you can post select, pre-select, don't select, do select. It just depends on what you want to do. It's actually very, very open uh, to the way that things can be done. So if I were to take a look at it, come into SolidWorks here, let's uh, just bring up a part that has some information on it. So, you know, a lot of times we go to the sketch button, we start the sketch, then we then have to pick a plane or a flat place or something like that. And the thing with though, is you notice I had to go to another tab first to get to the sketch button so I could click the sketch button so that I could go pick there. That's a lot of movement back and forth. Now, granted, we do have some you know quick keys here if we do a right click i am going to be very honest and blunt i am not a great picture reader they took my words away about 10 years ago and i'm still angry about it at this time so um one thing i do kind of want to point out is this can be started in multiple ways like if you're going to make a sketch it's probably because you're going to draw something i'm going to draw a line so if you go to the line tool well basically that's just like picking a sketch and now all you have to do is pick the surface or plane or whatever you want on there so you don't even have to say start a sketch and then go to the line command, you just go to line command. If you're not in a sketch, SolidWorks is going to go, well, now you got to pick a base. Okay? So that's one way we can do it. <coughs> the other way we can do it is we can pre-select and then start the line command, and that does the same thing, except now I can just draw right on that face and be done with it. Okay? The other ways that we can do this is we can start by doing a feature. A lot of times it's, well, I need to make an extrusion. Okay, well, in order to make an extrusion, you have to have a sketch. So first thing we do is we go to the sketch tool. We click the sketch, edit sketch. We go pick a plane. Well, why don't if I just pick a face and then say extrude, it's going to start an extrude, start a sketch on that face. And then when I draw my information that I'm looking to do here, when I hit the OK to get out of the sketch, it's going to go ahead and put me right into the extrude command because I started everything by saying I'm going to do this command. All right. The only thing that I can say about this particular way of doing things is I always, when I'm done with my sketch, I always go back to the tool again to say I need to do an extrusion. I always forget that I can just exit out of the sketch. All right. So, like I said before, pre-select, post-select, do select, don't select. It's it's all there for you at that point. So just uh, different ways to do it. Don't get pinned into one style, especially if it's a couple extra mouse button hits every time. Uh, let's take a look at what we have here. So basically, I find people get into a certain way of making sketches all the time. Unfortunately, it's the same thing that they learned when they first started using the software. And that may not be the most effective and efficient way, especially if you have someone like myself silently judging you while I watch you work. Um, so, all right. Uh, freeze, you're under duress. So, you know, conditions that we might get into, I mean, you know, some of us work with simple parts and it's a plate with a hole in it. Yay, great, not a big deal. But um, a majority of us might work on, you know, things that are a little bit more complex. They got a lot of features on them. They got a lot of holes in them, stuff like that. Um, and what happens is uh, there's the rebuild button. Everybody knows what the rebuild button is, right? Make a change, hit rebuild, it updates, right? Um, how many of you guys know the control Q button? couple people do all right those that don't know what the control Q is is if you have a really complicated part it's a great time to take a vacation when you hit control Q uh, control Q does a deep dive from top to bottom rebuild of your part if you ever get a random error especially more complex parts like say you're working on like a mouse or you know something that's very complex and all of a sudden you have the randomly blowing up features every once in a while you don't even do anything to the feature just you hit rebuild once and all of a sudden it blew up on its own um, usually a control Q will do that if you're ever in an assembly even though this isn't for assemblies but if you have a large assembly and you go to move something and all of a sudden a bunch of your mates blow up sometimes hitting control Q fixes the issue I've watched people panic and then sit there for a half hour trying to fix an issue that the control key would have just done a, a deep dive rebuild and got rid of it so don't discount the control Q key, uh, but don't uh, yell at yourself when you hit it all the time. But let's talk about the freeze bar, because the freeze bar actually allows me to use this a little bit more often. So let's take a look at uh, maybe a, something a little bit more complex than a block with fillets on it. Uh, 
Oh, freeze bar. Hey, look at that. I even named it freeze bar and I couldn't find it. <coughs> All right, so a little complicated. Um, if we come up to our evaluation tab and we look at the performance, this is not indicative. This is not a basic part. So, um, but if we take a look at it, uh, there are 287 features in this one part alone. All right. Um, it used to be the biggest part I saw until I have another customer that they had 654 features. And I was like, there's no way you need that. And they actually needed it. It's sad. All right. <laughs> So um, I'm going to go all the way down here. I'm going to zoom this up so even the people in the back can see. But does everybody know what this little blue line is at the bottom of the... Okay, that's our rollback bar, right? If I take it and I move it up, we roll back in time. All right. Now, I'm going to go ahead and zoom out here and go all the way to the top. All right. Does everybody see my yellow line? Does anybody else have the yellow line? Some people do. Okay. So the yellow line is what we call the freeze bar, all right? So if I grab the freeze bar and I go ahead and grab this all the way and I move it all the way down to the bottom, there we go, all right, don't do this. So I'm gonna get a uh, question here and it says, part needs updating to use freeze. Please do force regen or control Q uh, before moving the freeze bar in the manager. So we're gonna go ahead and say okay to that. And I'm gonna hit Control Q. And the reason I'm hitting Control Q is that SOLIDWORKS is doing one last regenerative rebuild to make sure everything has been calculated correctly. If, the same force rebuild? Yes, yeah, the force rebuild is, the, yeah, yeah. <coughs> and then of course we have errors, so we won't talk about the errors at this point in time. All right, so I went through and rebuilt it. I'm actually kind of, all right. Well, Oh, look, it's one of those errors that doesn't actually exist. Oh, oh there it there is. It is. <laughs> Just move on past it. You didn't see it. All right, so what I'm going to do is I grab that freeze bar and I moved it all the way down to the bottom of my part. It means that if for some reason I were to hit Control-Q right now, it just rebuilt that fast. And the reason being is that the only thing that's being rebuilt is anything that's under the yellow line. In this case, how many features are actually under my yellow line at this point? None. <laughs> So there's literally nothing being calculated. The only thing it does calculate is it is calculating the surface area and the mass at this time. That's the only thing that's being calculated. But sometimes what we run into is you'll have some pretty heavy features up front on a complex part, and then you'll have like stuff like the fillets and stuff afterwards, or maybe you're adding some little features here and there. The freeze bar works really good just to bring it down part way so that when you do the massive rebuilds, it stops rebuilding all those and just builds underneath it. The other thing is because I did a control Q, nothing is being modified above this line at all. In fact, if I try to double click on it and make a change to it, it'll bring the dimensions up here and I can make the change and I can hit rebuild, but it'll also move my uh, freeze bar up to that feature as well too, because it has to account for it. So it doesn't lock you out, but it does not modify on its own anymore at this time. Sound good? All right, now the downside of it is you have to turn it on. Uh, if you guys go back to work and you've never turned this on before, it's not gonna be there and you're gonna be like, oh, it must be a new thing. Freeze bar has actually been around since the early 2000s. So it's not a new feature. It's been around for well over a decade. Um, you do have to go to your options. This is a system options. And then somewhere it's, uh, well, let's just go here. So let's do a search. We're gonna type in freeze and there we go. So it says enable the freeze bar. Of course, it would be right in front of me. So you do have to turn that option on right there, all right? And it can be turned on and turned off as well too, all right? So kind of good. Is that useful for anybody here in the crowd? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah, this actually works really good for assemblies. You take that freeze bar up to the next level. And not that you can freeze assemblies, but you can freeze the parts in the assemblies. Um, I've actually had some limited success when I import really heavy data um, and you got that big, nasty, ugly import feature in there, and every time you rebuild it, it wants to do a bunch of calculations on it. Pull it under the free, or put it above the freeze, and when you do the rebuild, it just ignores the fact that that is staying alone. So it does actually speed up your rebuilds with imported components. So keep it in mind. Yeah. Well, you know, if if you got a cylinder with chamfers on the end that's not going to help you with anything, right? Those are pretty easy parts. Your more complex components, you might want to take a little extra time in there. So it'll definitely help out. Sound good? 
All right, so um, long rebuild time's getting you down. Got lots of features out of time for a low, low price of checkbox. You can get that ahead. So make sure you remember, you have to turn this on to get to it. Oh, like the freeze bar, get it? All right. All right, so let's get into uh, fillets here. So a um, couple different things about fillets that I wanted to get into with you. One, they uh, actually, as of I think 2018, they became a little bit of a chameleon. Uh, in fact, there was a, a, a promise made to you guys if you watched the What's News and stuff like that, that they said, oh, you can now turn fillets in the chamfers and chamfers in the fillets. And then you went in and you tried to do it and it didn't work. All right. Um, and that's because it has to be a particular type of fillet is uh, what we found out. So let me bring up some geometry here. And uh, if I take a look at it, like let's just throw a fillet on here. In fact, let's start with a chamfer. I have more success that way. Um, when you come in and you do a chamfer, usually we pick an edge. It's chamfer, ta-da, all right. Um, and what we don't see here is the option to turn it into a fillet, all right? So you have to do a particular type of fillet. Is it this one? Let's do this one. I think it's that one. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. And then if I do a right click and edit the feature here, it's going to make me a big fat liar. This is what happens when you think you know what's going on, but you really don't know what's going on. All right, let's try one more time here. Looks like I may be calling this a bug here in a second. There it is. All right. So in this particular case, I did do what's called a face fillet which I pick one face, put another face in, I get a fillet between them. When I go back to modify it though, you will see that these do change. So yeah, I, it was the one button I didn't click is the one that it works for. So make sure you pay attention to the icon there. But I can actually take that very quickly and turn it into a chamfer and vice versa, just to make sure that I know what I'm talking about. So you have to pick the faces. Yeah, you can't just pick an edge, unfortunately. So. Um, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> Not really. Why would it, right? So there's your chamfers. And then if I right click and edit that, we can turn this into a fillet. And now you have a feature. That's why it's called the chameleon. See, I even named it. It's the chameleon. See, chameleon. So now I have a feature called uh, fillet, which is actually a chamfer. And then I have a chamfer, which is actually a fillet. So I don't get yeah, right. So but you guys were in the first one, so I just do this just for fun anyway. All right. So um, you can change them. It is very particular. It's only one type of fillet and one type of chamfer that can actually have this chameleon effect. And unfortunately, it's not the one that we go to automatically in most cases. So. Just uh, keep it in mind, and yeah, I think uh, I haven't done it in a long time, and I think I forgot the fact that it doesn't rename it. And that's why I quit showing people it, so. All right, let's go back to fillets. What's that? Uh, well, yeah, it is. I won't lie. All right. Uh, corner fillets. So, um, let's take a look at. All right, so let's take a look at a condition here. And uh, I'm just gonna throw in a seven millimeter fillet because you know that's pretty stock size, right? Oh, and then I'm in the face fillet tool. And then here, okay, take a breath, Ryan. There you go. All right, so pretty standard. Put fillets on four corners, say okay to that. And then I hand this off to the machinist and they call me up and they're like, can you like wrap that around? I mean, there's a lot of time that's happening here that it has to move the mill in this direction and then here they would like to kind of take it and then wrap it around. Now, um, if you don't know that there's a function for this, you end up adding material, making a sweep with a really tiny radius with a circle on the end of it and cut it out. And it takes a couple of minutes and you guys have spent enough time with me over the last 15 minutes to know that that's way too much work for me, all right? So cool part is, is if you need to wrap around a corner as opposed to coming to a hard corner, 
Um, I'm going to go back and just modify the fillet. You could do this before you create the fillet, but I'm going to go back and edit it. And it's way, way, way down here in this thing called fillet options, which is always scrunched up and no one realizes that there's actually tools in here. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to expand it out and uh, we'll grab here and right here there's an option called round corners all right so i'm going to zoom out and uh, if i click that round corners with just a simple click of a button i can now wrap those fillets around no problem it goes up to a nice tight arc at the top it makes it pretty easy for the machinist side to be able to get that together for you kind of cool except you went all the way to the corner though I kick people out of the last class. I will kick you out of here too. Didn't you get kicked out last time? Yeah. You weren't supposed to come back. <laughs> oh, this is being recorded. I'm gonna have to dub over this one. Does that work for jumpers too? Uh, no. But before I just blankly say no, let's double check it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't wrap corners with a face fillet, so technically no. Um, I'm going to say no. Yeah, no, it doesn't do with Phil. It would be down here. So that sounds like an enhancement request. Good luck. <laughs> All right. Uh, different shapes. Fillets can be of different shapes. Um, uh, really, this is more for product designers and stuff like that as you get into it. Um, what I found is I have to deal with some product designers uh, from uh, various companies like Steelcase and um, Whirlpool, uh, their design studio and stuff like that. They actually use SolidWorks. And uh, it kind of took me aback a little bit. I will say I'm, I'm a traditional mechanical designer. I make machine components and all that good stuff. And then when I put two fillets on and it makes it look all nice, I'm very proud of myself, but you do show a product designer and they kind of like, oh, that's nice, you know? And it's like, well, what's the problem? It's got roundy corners on it, right? Um, well, the problem is, is it, it doesn't look nice in, in, in a product setting. You know, like if I had regular fillets on my mouse, I'd be like, well, that looks clunky. I mean, go back to the old three button mouse that was like, you know, like make a block, put a chamfer on, put some fillets on. Woo -hoo. Like, yeah, great. All right, so um, let's take a look at some of the options here. There's actually a ton of options. I'm not gonna go through them all, but I am gonna point out where they can be found. So the main couple of places here is, I'll just pick this edge so we can kind of see it as we do it here, is uh, one symmetric. Symmetric is the regular round radius that we're used to. You can get in there with the ball nose and be good with it. You can actually make it asymmetric now as well too. This is gonna give you, uh, it's gonna be a parabola as opposed to a circle, okay? And so basically what you do is you give the major and minor axes in here. So if I say 3.5, you'll see that it goes down 3.5, but it's seven this way. And it kind of gives you that nice sweepy swoopy type of operation there, okay? Um, previous to this coming into play, and this has been around for uh, probably at least four years. So this is not brand new technology, but it's kind of hidden in with all these other options. Uh, prior to this, this was basically the easiest way to do this was a whole bunch of surface operations. So you would get in there and do some offsets and put in some sweeps and stuff like that. Now you do have the ability to change not only the, whether it's symmetric or asymmetric, but you can also change your profile down here as well too. I went back to symmetric and one of the other options is to do what's called a conic row or conic radius. Same thing, just it's a different input into it, okay? So a conic basically allows me to switch it up and kind of ease into items here. Let me go ahead and make this about 10 millimeters. And uh, so that's gonna be the radius, the offset from the end to here. Um, and then you can play with the conic row or the conic radius. And there's a little drop down here that you can play with. But if I make it tight, like 0.1, you'll see that it kind of, it, it's still tangent at the bottom, but then it instantly starts heading towards the other way. So you can kind of play with this number to get something a little less roundy like this, or something that's a little bit tighter where it kind of eases into it. And you'll see that it takes a long time before it finally starts turning the corner, but it is an easement into it. So it gives you a very nice smooth edge. If you're gonna be doing anything that's gonna be visible to people and they're gonna interact and touch it and feel it, these are really good radiuses to use. No, it's just it's just a single one here. 
Yep, it's 10 millimeters from each side there. So we're used to the radius. It's the same as the radius, but really it's just that offset from the corner. These can be done with asymmetry as well too. So you can get pretty fancy in here and uh, come up with some really nice things. So it's just something we've never had before. Um, your machinist will hate you when you give it to them. <laughs> right, just because you can make it. Um, I can put a half inch pin in a quarter inch hole too. So um, the other ones that we have here are what are called curvature continuous. Um, these are more, uh, this is, it's not a radius. Curvature continuous, if you ever hear that inside of SOLIDWORKS, it's uh, how smooth is it? Um, and really the best analogy I have is that if I blindfold you and give you a block with sharp corners and I say, can you show point out where the corner is? You're gonna very be, you know, very easily pick where the corner is just by feeling it. If you have a radius on it and I ask you blindfold to tell me where the radius starts, amazingly enough, you can feel where it goes from flat to round and you can accurately say at this point right here, that's where my fillet starts. When you do curvature continuous, you'll know, you'll know that you've gone into a curve, but you'll never feel when it went from flat to round, okay? So it gives you a very smooth transition, and that's all it is. Once again, a lot of these tools that we have here, previous to us having the capability, there was a bunch of surfacing and lofting and stuff that needed to happen to get these to work. So these are really nice tools if you've ever had to do this previously. it looks like that but not with less lines <laughs> and actually a, a good way to kind of show it here um, we can uh, we can virtually feel this well now that sounds weird um, <laughs> there it is so I'm gonna crank up the number of lines on here and I'm gonna crank up my tolerance as well too so what we're seeing here is you'll see that there's a smooth transfer from this face to this face. And it means that from a field touch point, it would be very hard to discern that difference there. Uh, if we were to change this back to a different radius, just a normal radius that we're used to. So we'll just do circular, say, okay, don't change anything. You're gonna see that there's a sharp transition there. And that's what we would see if it was machined out perfectly and put in strip lighting like this, we would actually see that reflection take a sharp angle. That's also, we would feel that sharp angle change as well too. So um, not too much there. And I'm actually show you a different case where this works out pretty good, but just know that you have different fillet types that are available out there and uh, they work out pretty good. So it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're doing machine components that are very prismatic and you're just putting a fillet on just to kind of cut the corner, don't use the fancy fillets. It's a complete waste of time. All right, uh, face fillets we talked about. So I, I like showing people this because there's something called the fillet game. Does anybody know what the fillet game is? Fillet game starts out like this. I have an edge. I need to put a fillet on it. So I put a fillet on it of a quarter inch. I hit okay, Solars goes, nope. I'm like, okay, maybe I can do a 3 16 fillet. Nope, maybe an eighth inch. Nope, you get down to 0 .03, finally it goes, and you're like, I needed a little three fillet in, and then you move on with your life. The fillet game is the geometry is not supportive of the fillet, and therefore uh, our first response is, okay, make it smaller. But I've made like, I've started out at a quarter inch and the point zero zero three finally worked and I'm like, okay, that's a little tad bit ridiculous, but I guess that's what I wanted. So um, ultimately what we have to know is um, fillets inside of the software are a little bleeding heart, okay? The problem that you're usually running into is, especially with more complex geometry, is you're running into uh, little edges and little sliver surfaces that are stopping the fillet from working correctly. And the fillet being a bleeding heart is going, oh, I don't want to orphan that fillet or that face or that edge or whatever. So it fails out so it can help that little edge or little face survive in the wild or whatever. So let's take a look at here and uh, we're going to go into our fillet tool and uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick this edge. Now this could, no, wait, okay. There we go. So I put a fillet here, put a fillet here. I do keep my full preview on, so you can see this is gonna work wonderfully for me at this time. Um, now, it's not 10, let's, uh, I think three will work. Uh, nope, two. One. Are none of these working today? Oh, I have curvature continuous, there we go, all right. So let's go ahead and change this, let's see, three does not work, two 
works 2.5, oh, 2.4, 2.3. Two point works out just fine for me, I guess. All right. Okay, so now that I said the fillet game and showed it to you, has anybody played the fillet game? Raise your hand. Yeah, everybody's played the fillet game, right? You didn't know it had a name, right? All right. So um, actually, it wasn't this that was causing too much of a problem, it was this. And what happens is when this fillet gets big enough, the two points here on the fillet, they touch. And when they touch, this poor little surface gets orphaned from its original body. Well, that's the problem we're running into. So if you ever get into a situation where you're trying to put a fillet on, especially if it's more complex geometry, one thing that you can do is don't use the regular fillet tool. Use the face fillet tool. We saw this a little bit earlier, right? Um, the reason I like the face fillet tool is because it takes no prisoners. I want to fill it from this face to this face, and I want it to be three millimeters. Notice that it gives me my preview. I say okay, and uh, it doesn't care that it's going to orphan it. So um, where the uh, regular fillet is a bleeding heart, the face fillet is um, a jack booted stomper. And it just goes, I don't care about you. It kicks deer on the weekend and probably kicks little puppy dogs. So the fillet game is actually played opposite with the face fillets. So if you go to put a fillet in and you're using a face fillet and it fails, did you notice that when it was set at two millimeters, it failed out? So it it's bleeding heart in the opposite way. It's like, if I'm not ruining someone's life, I'm not gonna work for you, all right? So keep that in mind. So. Uh, if a face fillet fails, you play the opposite fillet game, which is you have to go bigger to get it to work. And if you don't want it to go bigger, then you go to the other fillet. And if that fillet, you don't want it to go smaller, you go back to the face fillet. So now you guys actually have a little bit of choice there going on. Sound good? All right. Jack booted. Gangster. All right. Um, not all that complex is really what it comes down to. All right. So make sure you play with your fillets as much as possible. All right. Wrapping. Yo, um, NWA, right? Nobody? All right. So no skills required. I was dying laughing the whole time I was writing this. Mad easy. Uh, not only for tech. So how many of you guys are familiar with the wrap function? Anybody? A little bit? What do you use? Have you used it? Something or other, right? Like that, something round. Okay. So really what it comes down to, and this doesn't have to be text per se, um, although I can write some text here. So let's uh, go ahead and start typing. Okay, there we go. Wait, that's too many letters. There we go. And then we'll say okay to that, and then we'll actually move that over. So um, I made sure it was blue text on a blue part, so it was really easy to see. <laughs> And then we're gonna get out of here. The wrap function actually is one of the tools that's not available right here at this time. Uh, but if you go to insert features, you will see the wrap function in here somewhere. There it is. And then uh, it's gonna ask me a couple questions. Ah, this is a little bit of a pre-select post-select. So we're talking about sketches and we're like, doesn't matter how you do it. This one, eh, get out of it. We're gonna grab the text first or the sketch first and then we're gonna go into that command and uh, it'll ask me a lot less questions. So you have a couple different choices here. Basically, uh, when you wrap the text, you can have it not only wrap the sketch around and extrude it, or you can cut it in, or you can do what's called a split function where it'll just make the edge of the text on the surface itself, not extrude it, not do anything. I actually use this a lot when I'm doing like decal work and I wanna paint like pinstriping, I'll use this function like that. Now there is two wrap methodologies down here. Um, the, the wrap, the spline surface here is newer to the software. It's been around for a couple years, but it used to be you could only do this on cylinders or cones. No spheres, if, you know, I guess you could wrap flat stuff too. I mean, start a sketch on it, it's doing the same thing, right? Um, but now with this option here, you can pretty much do any surface. And I've had some fairly complex surfaces, and I'm not talking about the project sketch. If you've ever projected a sketch up to a surface, when you line those up, that sketch lined up perfectly with the projection. This will literally wrap it around the items. So if I take a look at this one, let's go ahead and zoom out here. Uh, the face that I wanna wrap it on is right here. We can actually see it wrapping it around at that time. So I'll go ahead and say okay to that. This is pretty straightforward, extrudes it out whatever you want it to be, but it should work pretty well. This, this is one of those, I think it's an underused tool for the most part. Um, but when it, you do need it, I haven't had too many issues with it up to date. Sound good?
That's your wrapping yo. Multibodies. Um, really, there's a couple different things you can do with multibodies. How, how many people are familiar with multibodies? A little bit here, a little bit there, maybe now. All right. So uh, I want to show you some kind of common techniques that are out there uh, just to kind of get you into it, show you a couple things with mirror, and then uh, even using these as almost like pseudo assemblies as well too. Uh, they can be pretty beneficial that way as well too. So let me get in and open, uh, let's see, bridging, there we go. So one of the things that I kind of harp on, especially as a trainer, as a long time user of the software, is I harp a lot on design intent. And uh, I argue a lot with people because it's uh, the usual argument is I don't have time for design intent. Um, and, and my usual response to I don't have time for design intent was apparently you've got lots of time to fix a lot of crap or do extra work. All right. Uh, my whole thing inside of SolidWorks is you put 10 minutes in, you're going to get an hour out of the software. Uh, if I cut 10 minutes and I try to cut corners, I'm going to have to work an extra hour later on. So I'm very cognizant about cutting corners just to get something done up front. If I can spend just even an extra minute, sometimes it's well worth that extra minute's worth of time. All right. So one of the things that I want to talk about here is when you're designing something. So design intent, really, we're trying to focus on what's important here. Now, in this particular case, I've got two bosses. They're connecting two items together. And when I'm designing this, those are the important parts of my design because those have to connect to something. Now, when I have something like this, this would be what's called a multi-body. I have two solids that are not touching each other. And one of the common things that I use this for is something that we call a bridging technique. I have two or more items that are important in my design. I don't really care how they're connected. That's something that comes a little bit later, all right? So I go through, I find out the position for this, and it's exactly where it needs to be. And then I find the position for this, for this and it's exactly where it needs to be but in order to get this to work as a real part I can't just have two bosses floating in place so my next step is to bridge the parts together to make a single continuous piece and the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna use a simple loft here or sweep because I actually use the right words when I talk um, I'm gonna go in and make this my profile and what I have here is that it's always offset a couple of millimeters from the end here I'm following the draft here so if I change any of these bosses, their position, their size, their diameter, anything, this sketch is so in tune with it, it'll just automatically update, okay? And then I'm gonna go ahead and go through and sweep it around this corner right here. And then let's make it a little bit fancier and tell SolidWorks that we wanna use this as a guide curve so it will actually go ahead and stretch that piece as it rounds the corner there, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and say okay to that. Now. Ideally, in the past, what would happen is um, you go back to before we had multi-bodies and I would have to make one boss, then I'd have to make the L section out into the middle of nowhere, and then I'd have to get my other boss to lay on top of it. It was somewhat difficult. Sometimes you had a lot of reference geometry in your sketches. You had a bunch of extra work and a bunch of upfront thinking. Here, I just have the two pieces that I had to worry about, and then I went back later and just put them together. So if I make a change to it, so if I double click on the boss down here and maybe I need to move this down from 150 to 200, that's going to work out okay there. If I change this from say 5 degrees to 2 degrees and uh, even if I change this to a smaller diameter, so let's change this to 80. When I hit the rebuild button, we can see that everything updates together. What it is, is I don't really care about the bridging. I don't worry about it. It's not something I have to follow up with. It's not something I had to think about. It just works because it's based on the positions of everything else. Kind of make sense? So this is the little bit of extra thinking that if you put into it, did you notice how quickly my changes happen? And I changed a lot there. Positioning, angles, distance, all kinds of things. And it just updated automatically. Fair enough? All right, keep it in mind. Couple minutes of thinking up front can probably save you a lot of time on the backside. <clears throat> or if you have a younger, newer person into it, you just hit them with the soap in the sock till they figure it out. Okay. There was a conversation held earlier. All right. All right. So, um, but let's look what else that we could do with uh, common bodies here, multi bodies. So, in a case like this, what I have is I've got a nice little sheet here. And uh, I went ahead and what I need to do is I need to make something that kind of, kind of doesn't look like that, um, kind of has this shape in it, but I want to have like a crisscross grid inside of here, 
okay? So I've gone through, and just to kind of see what this is, it's a simple thin, it's not a surface, it's just a thin revolve. Um, I've got an extrusion going through there. These are separate bodies, so I shelled out this block, so I can basically, I'm just working on this. And then I threw a rib in there. And then I went ahead and did a pattern. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and come in here and I'm gonna create a mirror. What I wanna do is I wanna create the cross pattern in here. Well, that would be another rib and another pattern, but what if I were just to come down here to bodies and then say, I wanna mirror this whole thing. I don't care how many features are in it. It's just the whole thing, the way it looks right now. And then I'm gonna mirror it around the plane in the center here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna tell SOLIDWORKS that I wanna merge these together. So it is gonna create two bodies, but then as soon as I hit the merge together, that gives me a nice little honeycomb feature pretty quickly, okay? Now I'm gonna turn that other body back on here. There it is. And uh, one of the things that you can do is make more complex shapes with simple shapes. It's really what it comes down to. So I'm gonna come in, go to insert, I'm gonna to go to features, and I'm gonna do something called a combine. Now when you do a combine, you can either add bodies together to make a single continuous body. You can do a subtraction. This is actually a function I used a lot uh, when I did machine work and I had a nest for a part. I'd take a block, I'd take the part and I'd shove it into the, the nest and then I'd say, subtract the part from there. And it left a nice, perfect impression into the nest for me. Worked out pretty good. Uh, not here, no. You weren't supposed to pick up the whole offset thing. That was a surface offset, but yes. All right, so the other one that we have in here is what we call combine. Combine's kind of cool because um, it's if I have two bodies that intermesh together, when I do the common option, what's left over is where the bodies actually intersected. So if I were to pick this and pick this and say, okay, what's left over where they is where they intersected, and it gives me a fairly complex shape with not a lot of work. Simple revolve, simple rib, simple pattern, and then have those pieces come together. So um, you can do some pretty complex stuff. And, and actually, if I show, um, you know, when I first saw this part, I instantly was like, well, it's gonna be a surface, then I could do this, and I can wrap this, and I can do this. Like, I already had 20 features lined up of how I was gonna do this. This is nothing, right? So when you get to complex situations, be a little careful with it. Sometimes simple solutions are the answers, okay? Um, another thing that you wanna pay attention to is uh, this actually works really good if you have to get a 2D drawing and turn it into a three-dimensional part. Uh, there's a whole 2D to 3D toolbar. We're not gonna go into it here, but definitely give you something to look at. But when you bring in a three-view sketch or even a multi-view sketch, what you could do is you could pick the view that's the front. You just draw a window around it in the sketch, and then you tell SolidWorks that that's the front view, and it pops it onto the front plane. And then you can go to the top view in this 2D drawing. You can pick the, all this part, all the pieces in the, the top view, and say put it in the top view, and it actually rotates it in space and keeps it lined up. So you can do this kind of conversion, and then it gives you like a glass box. And there's a whole bunch of tools that allow you to quickly extrude and do all kinds of stuff. So, so there's some really cool things you could do with that. But usually once I get it on the front, the top, and the right, I extrude one block this way, one block this way, one block down. And where all three of those are intersecting together, I tell it to remove everything else. And I have the part sitting there, pretty as can be in most cases. If not, it's a really close analogy to it and just a little bit more work to get it finalized. So... Pretty cool function uh, with that combine. You do lots of cool things with it, especially if you start thinking outside the box. Um, oh, no. Pseudo assemblies. Uh, basically, really just to kind of show it to you more than anything else. <coughs> so, Nice little wagon. If you're taking the sheet metal course, that's where I ripped it from. So basically, uh, this is made of multiple parts and pieces. In fact, I have a cut list here. And not only do I have the sheet metal cut list, but I also have the various pieces, the axle, the clevis that's in here, um, all that stuff is here. Uh, technically, it's an assembly, but it's not an assembly. I don't need movement here, so it's I don't have a problem doing it like this. Uh, but it does kind of show you the power of what you can do. Now, sometimes people get a little loosey-goosey, like, well, I have to have a bill of material. Fine. 
uh, put in your cut list and you can make it look like a bill of material. It works exactly like a bill of material does. So just be uh, cognizant of that and uh, we'll go from there. Sound good? So like I said, it is a part file. It's a multi-body part file. And uh, here you go. I, the nice thing I like about it, I only have to worry about this one part. Although if you take a look at my files here, there's the wheel and then there's the clevis as well too. So kind of using it like an assembly. Yes? Not in this particular one. It was all made of sheet metal pieces, but I could use weldment. On, on any of these? Uh, I right click and hit flat pattern and it shows me the flat pattern. And then if I form it up, so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're unable to show all flats at the same time, but you could very easily open up a new drawing and say, I need a flat of this, 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 and it'll create all the flat patterns for you. All right, so like I said, pseudo assemblies. Um, I actually use these, especially if you're getting any kind of electronics. You get a circuit board and it's got 300 freaking transistors and resistors and everything on it. Grab everything as an assembly, file save as a part throw all the other stuff away you have a part that's complicated but it's just one file you gotta kind of manage at that time so lots of different cool ways you can utilize it all right fixing broken drains and parts um, has anybody ever tried to make a change to a part and it blew up on it raise your hand everybody right okay nothing I can do all right, there is a method. So, no, there's actually a method. It is something that uh, if you if you take a breath and actually it's it's one of the things down here. You know, things break. Take a breath. Parametrics are the way parametrics work. This happens. Period. Um, you can you can reduce the amount it's going to break sometimes, but if you're making a major change, things are probably going to break. And the first thing I want you to do: stop what you're doing. Don't yell at the computer. Don't hit your screen. If anything should get kicked, it should be the computer, not your screen, all right? So uh, keep that in mind, but let's kind of take a look at a situation here. We'll start it off, um, but really I wanna give you a couple of items to, um, are you kidding me? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much how you feel, right? Oh, there you go, are you kidding me? <laughs> not uncommon, right? Open up a brand, you know, an old part and, oh great, that's nice, or you make a change and this is what it ends up looking like. So one thing I do kind of want to point out here is um, there is a method to the madness here, all right? So the feature manager, does everybody know what the feature manager does? Holds the features, right? Is there any particular order going on here? Or the, is it alphabetical? You're shaking your head, you're nodding, yes. What's the order? Time, right? When did you make it? So I'm gonna guess that's my first feature and I'm gonna guess that's my last feature. So here's the cool part. Because we are time compliant in our features and you can't reorganize, well, you can reorganize it, but really you're reorganizing time when you're in there. Um, understand that the best way to fix something when it breaks like this is you go to the top most air item, period, right? If I were to go to the fillet down here, I'm betting that the problem with the fillet is the edge it's supposed to be on is gone, right? So if I started from the bottom, would it actually would I be able to fix anything? Probably not, all right? So always go to the topmost item and work your way down. Sometimes you fix the first item and everything else works out okay after that. Sometimes you gotta fix a couple items. Sometimes you gotta fix them all. But if you go out of order, you're not gonna do yourself any kind of good will there all right so i'm going to come up to the first one and the first thing we do is we right click on it and then we edit the part or edit the sketch don't do that because i will tell you i've been on solidworks since 1995 and if i go into it thinking i know what's going happening i always guess wrong the best thing you do is you right click on the feature and you go what's wrong okay <laughs> and to kind of put that in order um, so, you know, we hit the what's wrong and it will give us a list of what's going on. Now, one thing you guys will notice, I don't know if you noticed it, but um, one of the things that I hate about SOLIDWORKS is default out of the box. If I open up this part, it gives me this huge list of like, this is everything that's wrong. <laughs> Great. There's things in that list I can't fix, so I don't care to see it. So I actually hit this display what's wrong during real build, rebuild and I turn it off. I want to know what's wrong. If you right click on a feature, it tells you specifically what's wrong with that particular feature. I don't care about anything underneath it. So I'm going to go ahead and look at it. It says sketch cannot be used because of blah, blah, blah. 
Yeah, here's the deal, whatever with that. It says the sketch can't be used, so now I know I need to modify the sketch, okay? Now, with this one, we actually have an issue way up here. Um, there's a little line. Zoom in. Zoom in. Oh, there it is. So it happens to be, um, yeah, zero millimeters long. All right, well, I don't think that's my problem, so let's delete it. And then... Uh, What's that? Yep. Yeah. I mean, I don't, because. Um, <laughs> um, how about I show you a tool that'll help you out? It's almost as cool as Sketch Expert. All right. Yes, sir. That is a awesome idea yeah yeah uh, especially if you don't know it like like that one that one's pretty blatant um but yes i would take that as a consideration always i don't like deleting stuff because sometimes you delete it and you break your part even more yay good job all right so um there are still issues with this and the initial issue said that a, an endpoint was wrongly shared it means i have three lines going to the same endpoint do you guys see three lines going to the same endpoint no i don't either so let's go ahead and fix this so the way you fix it is you go i don't know what's going on and then you try to exit out of your sketch and then solarx pops up and goes hey dummy you didn't fix anything all right so it gives me two choices here it says take it back to where it was you know and then you still have an error or it says show the problem using sketch or check sketch for feature now it pops up the same error message what i like is this window repair sketch pops up um what it's showing me is it puts on my spyglass down here and I can actually zoom in. So is that kind of the condition you're talking about, Faith? Yeah. So in a case like this, uh, while it was a good idea to turn that into construction geometry, um, I'm going to go ahead and delete it, but that's always a consideration to make. So it's a great consideration. And then I'm going to put that together. All right. But notice up here, it says I actually have two issues in here, not just one. So that was one condition. Oh, we're going to be finishing this out here quickly. So then I'm going to go to two, and then there's that other little line. It zooms into the issue, so you don't have to go looking for it. So has anybody ever hunted for the corner, the bad corner? Uh -huh. Yeah, don't do that. Just let this start working for you. Another recent comment. There it is. Ta-da. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, hit the rebuild here. It says no problems are found. We can get out. Really what I want to show you here is... Uh, SolidWorks crashing, continue. There we go. All right, really what I want to show you there, I still have some issues in here, but notice once I fixed the first issue, there was a nice cascade effect that happened here and it opened everything up for us, all right? So if anything, what's wrong? Um, nothing, okay, something's wrong. Um, take a breath, parametrics will do this to you, especially if you're making gross changes. Uh, the deleting and turning things into construction line is a major issue that you run into. That's why we tell people don't delete things uh, because you probably you might be deleting a reference for another sketch, which is going to blow up that sketch, which blows up the feature, which causes another. So it's always this cascade thing, and it's not. Don't do anything. Just be aware that this can happen, and when your errors pop up, go to the topmost error and work your way down. Now, um, once again, that's not a an assemblies class in here. But if you guys have ever been in an assembly and all of a sudden your mates go all bad, mm -hmm. the whole go to the top mate and work your way down doesn't work. So don't try it at an assembly. Uh, come back, uh, look online even as well too. I've got a couple of things out there that talk about why mates don't work the same way. Okay. Oh, I guess that was it. Look at that. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. All right, guys, thank you very much. I do appreciate your time. Hopefully you guys learned something.